November 1918, Northeastern Europe. Russia has been defeated in the Great War and has suffered two revolutions that have led to the communist Bolsheviks taking control of most of the country. Their power is being contested by the political opposition and remnants of the Russian Imperial Army who have formed the White Guard. Many areas of the country are engulfed in a brutal civil war. The western borderlands of the Russian Empire have been taken over by Imperial Germany. But now Germany has been defeated in the west and is forced to abandon its conquests. German army prepares to leave the occupied territories as the Red Army musters its forces to begin the takeover. Meanwhile, many of the nations freed from the occupation don't want to be ruled by Bolsheviks and they prepare to resist the Reds. Lacking armed forces, effective government and having politically divided populations, these new states attempt to hold back Red Army's advance. One of them is Estonia. All of Estonian territory had fallen under German occupation. In the end of November, the Estonian government had only been in power for a couple of weeks and was struggling to gather its forces. Meanwhile, Red Army was assembling near the border. Among them were pro-Bolshevik Red Estonian riflemen and the Red Fleet. Soon, most of the German troops had left and the weak Estonian forces were unable to hold the line. On November 28th, the Red Army attacked Narva. With this battle, the Estonian War of Independence began. Supported by the fleet, thousands of Red Army soldiers overran natural defensive positions in the forests of northeast Estonia. Estonian army was constantly strengthened by new recruits, but morale was low and many men lacked the faith in victory and deserted the ranks. The next line of defense was established on Kunda River. By this time, the Estonian forces had grown in manpower, but the Reds broke through and captured the town of Rakvere. At the same time, the Estonian forces were preparing to defend the town of Tartu. On that part of the front, the Red Army was numerically inferior, but Estonian troops were plagued by low morale. Bolshevik agitators managed to incite some units to rebel, and the Estonian command lost the control of the situation. Tartu fell to the Bolsheviks without any resistance, and the Estonian troops retreated to the north. Having witnessed the lackluster performance of the Estonian forces, the Red Army Command came to the conclusion that the Estonian army would soon be defeated and they began reassigning units from Estonia to other fronts. However, the balance of power was slowly shifting in favor of the Estonian side. Despite of constantly being in retreat, the morale of the troops began to improve. Red Army continued to rely on its numerical superiority to push the Estonian forces back, but the strength of the Estonian troops was on the rise and the resistance intensified day by day. On the 12th of December, the British Navy had arrived in the Estonian capital. They brought much needed arms, including Lewis and Madsen light machine guns, a weapon unfamiliar to the Red Army. The Royal Navy also captured two Red Fleet's destroyers and transferred them to Estonian Navy. When the Red Army units reached only 40 kilometers from Estonian capital Tallinn, they had exhausted their strength and the Estonian forces put an end to their advance. Meanwhile, the government of the Estonian southern neighbor Latvia had far greater difficulties. Latvia had declared its independence under a nationalist government, but the Bolsheviks enjoyed a far greater degree of support among the local population. Therefore, the Red Army's elite units, the Red Latvian Riflemen, advanced through the country almost unopposed. The Latvian forces abandoned the capital city of Riga and retreated towards the west. In the westernmost corner of the country, they managed to establish a defensive line and were soon reinforced by German troops. On the other hand, Estonia was able to successfully mobilize and now many new units were arriving at the front. Estonian forces had also received help from its northern neighbor, Finland. By the start of January, the numbers of the Estonian forces and Red Army troops had become equal on the front. However, the Estonian forces were better equipped. In addition to possessing light machine guns, they had several armored trains and had gained the command of the sea. Estonian army began a counterattack. A strong push by the armored trains coupled with an amphibious landing forced the Red Army frontline troops into a retreat. Their attempts to set up a defense near Rakvere failed when Estonian troops landed behind their lines at Kunda. The Red Army forces became overextended while attempting to counter the threat from both sea and land. Many of their units became scattered or were captured during the retreat. However, soon the front reached terrain more suitable for defense. 
The Reds managed to hold off the Estonian frontal advance at Juhvi, but their position was flanked by a cavalry unit from the south and they were forced to withdraw further. Now the Red Army occupied heavily entrenched positions at Sinimad Heights, which were impossible to bypass. Estonian forces broke the deadlock by landing more than a thousand men behind the Red Army lines at Utrea. The Finnish volunteers broke into the town of Narva and the encircled Soviet units at the front surrendered. Now Estonian forces established a defensive line on the Narva river. During the following months, the Red Army made several attempts to go on an offensive in this sector, but they didn't achieve much success. Meanwhile, the Estonian High Command was gathering forces to recapture Tartu. The armored train formations and Lieutenant Julius Kuperianov's partisan battalion decided not to wait for reinforcements and retook the town with a surprise night attack. Now the Estonian forces were in position to expel the Reds from southern Estonia. They directed the main attack towards the important railway junction of Volga. The Soviets had sent the Red Latvian riflemen against them and here the best units of Estonia and the Red Army faced each other. With heavy fighting, the Estonian forces and Finnish volunteers pushed the Soviets back and after a costly battle at Pajo, they retook Volga. Meanwhile, other units crossed the Estonian-Latvian border and took up defensive positions along the strategic Ruyena-Volga narrow gorge railroad. On the eastern part of the front, Estonians were faced with demoralized Red Army troops mobilized from the war-weary Russian peasants. These units disintegrated before the Estonian army's advance and soon the Estonian forces reached Petchery, deep behind Red Army's lines. This threatened the Red Army's units with encirclement and they were forced to withdraw. Now the Estonian forces had reached their national border and their next goal was to establish forward defensive positions on Latvian territory. In the middle of February they continued their advance. The Red Army had received large reinforcements and repelled the Estonian troops back into their territory. After the initial defeats, the Red Army's forces had been greatly strengthened and now they were preparing to launch a large-scale offensive. However, the Red Army formations in Latvia and on the Pskov front lacked coordination, which allowed Estonian forces to defeat them one by one. The Soviets in the east began their offensive first by launching attacks from the front and over the frozen lake Ilamierv. After their advance had been fought to a standstill in March, they were joined by their Latvian comrades, who achieved some success in the south. Fighting against the Estonian troops stretched the Latvian Red Army's resources and this allowed the Latvian white forces and German troops to recapture most of western Latvia. After having stopped the Reds, Estonian forces counterattacked and retook most of the lost land in the south. Then with a concentrated assault carried out by armored trains, they recaptured Petchery and stabilized the front lines. Then the fighting was interrupted by the spring thaw. During the winter, the Soviets had been preparing for a major attack on Estonia and had organized new units. Now they were deployed on the front. All Red, Estonian, Latvian and Russian troops on that part of the front were organized into a formidable Estonian Red Army. On April 17th, the Reds embarked on their most serious attempt to conquer Estonia. Due to the lack of ice cover, the Red Army was unable to attack over the lakes and their attacks in the east were channeled in a small corridor and repelled. However, in the south, the Soviets' numeric superiority pushed the Estonian forces slowly back. The Estonian army had used up most of its reserves and their defenses were stretching to a breaking point. Only some kilometers from Vuru, the advancing raids were temporarily stopped. Now the raids attempted to break the stalemate by a diversionary attack in the west. There the Soviets lacked numerical superiority, but the morale of the Estonian soldiers was low. Estonian troops were deployed in Latvian territory, but they didn't have the will to fight abroad and were also exposed to propaganda by local Bolsheviks. The Red Latvian riflemen attacked and pushed the Estonian forces back over the national border, but they lacked the reserves for a follow-up attack. Eventually the discipline in Estonian units was restored and they counterattacked, recapturing all of the lost territory. Meanwhile the onslaught of the Reds under Vuru continued. Several weeks of unceasing fighting along with intensive Bolshevik propaganda took the Estonian soldiers fighting spirit to its critical low. It was likely that soon the Red Army would overrun Estonian defenses. That's when a new force emerged. Since the beginning of the war, many former officers of the Russian Imperial Army had been gathering in Estonia with the goal of fighting the Bolsheviks. By the beginning of May, they had organized themselves into the Northern Corps, an elite formation of 3,000 men. On May 13, they executed a thoroughly planned offensive on the Narva front. 
Their forces penetrated deeply behind Red Army's lines through unfavorable terrain and broke into the rear of main Soviet formations. In support of their offensive, Estonian Navy landed the Ingrian battalion behind Red Army's lines. The Soviet units, being threatened with encirclement, fled in disarray and the resistance to the Whites collapsed. Now, the Northern Corps reached into striking distance from Petrograd, the old imperial capital. The Soviet command could not afford to lose Petrograd under any circumstances. Reserves and forces from other fronts were scrambled together and thrown against the Whites. However, many of these units had mixed loyalties and defected to the Northern Corps. Ultimately, the Soviets mustered large amounts of troops and stopped the White Forces. Many of these units were taken from Estonian fronts, and so the Red Army's position there became dangerously weak. After the Northern Corps offensive into Russia, some commanders of the Red Estonian Riflemen were coming to the conclusion that the Reds were going to lose the war. They decided to defect to the Estonian side, Estonian command decided to use this opportunity to capture Pskov. The defectors paralyzed the Red Army's command, which allowed units to advance quickly into the Red Army's rear. Many Soviet units got the false impression that most of the Red Estonian riflemen had defected and fearing encirclement, they fled without offering resistance. The Estonian white troops entered Pskov. The Red Army in Latvia had also been overextended. The German and Latvian forces exploited this by taking Riga with a surprise attack. Then the Estonians broke through the Reds' front near Vodou and advanced deep into Red Army's rear, threatening to cut a bulk of the Latvian Soviet army off from Bolshevik Russia. On Daugava River, they linked up with Lithuanian troops, cutting off the Red Army units in central Latvia. The Latvian Red Army had suffered a major defeat and lost much of its strength. However, a new danger was emerging from the south. The German forces operating in Latvia had deposed the Latvian nationalist government and set up a puppet government, consisting of the local Baltic German nobility. Estonia continued to support the previous Latvian government. Many Latvian units, loyal to the nationalist government, were already serving under Estonian command. Estonian and German forces met near the Latvian town of Cesis. The German forces consisted of Baltic Landeswehr, a unit of Latvian Baltic Germans, and the Iron Division, consisting of volunteers from Germany. They were well equipped, but Estonians had the numbers and very high morale. This conflict was seen by many Estonian soldiers as the high point of the centuries-long power struggle between the local Baltic German landowners and Estonians, and they were eager to take part in the fight. The Germans attacked a Latvian nationalist unit and pushed it out of the town. After the initial clashes, the military missions of the Entente countries attempted to broker a peace between Estonians and Germans, but the talks failed. On July 19th, the Germans continued the offensive and the Baltic Landeswehr broke through the Estonian lines. However, the advance of the Iron Division was repelled and then the Estonians counter-attacked at Cesis. The German forces went into full retreat. Their attempt to regroup at Gauja River was thwarted and only on the entrenched positions before Riga did they manage to stop the Estonian advance. However, the arrival of Estonian fleet in the mouth of Daugava River threatened to cut off the Germans' path of retreat. Under the pressure of the military missions of the Entente countries, they were forced to sign an armistice and abandon their positions. The nationalist government in Latvia was restored and continued to be allied with Estonia until the end of the war. Meanwhile, the Red Army had gathered a strong force and began pushing the Northern Corps troops back along the whole front. The situation was especially critical near Pskov, where the Reds had large superiority. After defeating the Germans, Estonian units began to arrive to prop up the White Army's defense. Estonian command ordered its forces to push the Red Army deeper into Russia in order to create a buffer zone between Estonia and the Soviets. The attack was initially successful, but Estonian soldiers lacked the will to fight abroad and their performance suffered. The advance of the Estonian and White Army was stopped short of their objectives. The Red Army counter-attacked, directing its main effort towards the Estonian Army's communications and its path of retreat. At the same time, the Soviets pushed the Estonians and Whites back from the front. When the threat of being cut off became too real, the Estonian forces abandoned Pskov and retreated to the fortified positions on Estonian territory. For the rest of the war, this part of the front became stable and only attacks of diversionary character were attempted here. The final act of the war took place in the north. Here, the Northern Corps had fought off the Soviets and increased their strength. The Corps now consisted of 16,000 men and was renamed to Northwestern Army. 
Despite the increase in strength, the situation was becoming desperate for the Russian whites. They were in danger of losing their base of supply as Estonia was in the process of making peace with the Soviets and the Allies were about to stop delivering the supplies. The only fighting chance for them was conquering Petrograd with an army that wasn't fully prepared. First, they carried out a diversionary attack towards Pskov, thus diverting some Soviet troops defending Petrograd. Then the main forces of the Northwestern Army launched an all-out attack on Petrograd. The Reds' defenses collapsed and the Whites closed their distance to the city. Estonian Army had its own goal in this offensive. Their units were tasked with the capture of Krasnaya Gorka naval fortress in order to trap the Russian fleet at Petrograd. It seemed that the city was about to fall, but then Leon Trotsky arrived there and began feverishly organizing a defense. As the Red Army reinforcements were trickling to Petrograd by rail, the White Army's advance became bogged down and finally ground to a halt on the approaches to Petrograd. Now the Soviets counterattacked and began pushing the Whites back. The Northwestern Army, exhausted by continuous combat and having lost their hope for victory, began to lose its ability to fight. Their troops retreated towards the Estonian border. Meanwhile, peace negotiations were being held between Soviet Russia and Estonia. In order to secure a more advantageous border, the Red Army was ordered to capture the Estonian city of Narva. However, the Estonian forces had established extensive fortifications along the national border. Red Army attacked these positions in strength, but the defenses were well prepared. The battles here resembled the ones in the Great War on the Western Front. The Reds lacked artillery to achieve a breakthrough and took large casualties while pushing slowly forward. During November and December, Estonians and remaining Northwestern Army units repelled numerous Red Army assaults on their positions and were able to hold their ground. After the Red Army had exhausted its strength, a truce was finally signed on January 3, 1920. The Estonian War of Independence was over. It was officially concluded on February 2, 1920 with the signing of Tartu Peace Treaty between the Republic of Estonia and Soviet Russia. With the Peace of Tartu, the fighting in northeastern Europe started to come to an end. Lithuania made peace in July, Latvia in August and Finland in October 1920. Poland followed in March 1921. So finally, peace came to Eastern Europe. It lasted for 20 years and then the region was engulfed in another war. We'll look into it in our next video. Subscribe not to miss it and thanks for watching.